Okay, so now the first thing to start is the virtual box. So you all have a virtual machine installed, right? Okay. If not, please raise your hand. I mean, I've given tutorials, and after four hours, some people start, told me they couldn't start the virtual box. So please, if something works, just raise your hand. So you start the virtual machine, the sick one. All right, you log in as the OpsPy user. And you should change the energy settings that doesn't lock you out. Well, we'll actually do that now. Because um, I don't know the password of the OpsPy user. So just to get started, actually, can you please all go to settings? And it's somewhere in there. Um, security. security, I don't see it. Here. Oh, yeah. Um, Make sure it doesn't require your password, because if you let your laptop sleep otherwise, you have to enter your password. I'm not sure if anyone in the room knows the password for the ops by user, so you have to restart your machine otherwise. Just make sure the shows are not checked. Okay. To get started now, again, open the terminal here. Yep, no, that was wrong. Uh, Okay, um, go to desktop tutorial, okay, and that's where all these things happen. So I think, um, if you see here, there's the Python as well as the Opspec course, and if you mess something up, there's the reset and update script here. Just call that to reset the state of all the notebooks. So if you accidentally delete something, something doesn't work, just call that to get you back to a blank state. And ask if you want to reset everything. We'll just do that here, and then you're good to go. You don't, you don't have to do this. If you didn't do anything yet, it should be good. Okay, then you essentially, what you do, you're in the same um, folder, you type Jupyter dash notebook. So it's Jupyter dash notebook, no spaces in between, just one word. And then you hit enter. And this should open a browser, we'll actually do our tutorials. So th those who've never seen the Jupyter notebooks, I hope you attended my Python tutorial. Okay, you hit enter, and it should open a browser, and here we go. Okay, do you all have that? What was the command for Jupyter? Jupyter-notebook, like here. There's no space in between, just Jupyter-notebook. And make sure to launch it in this folder. So everything is the same for you. Okay, it opens a browser here. I'm going to make it full screen. Okay, and you see here, there are the Opspy and the Python crash courses. We're obviously going to do the Opspy courses. So you click on the Opspy folder, and this is like an large number of notebooks now. For starters, we will open the zero zero introduction one. Okay, so you click on it, and it opens a separate tab with this notebook. And if nobody objects, I all assume you get there. That's where we get started. Sure. The command, the terminal? Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's weird. Here. Just in this folder, make sure to type this here. Okay. We all set? Good. Okay, so you all launched the zero zero introduction one, and this should open this tab here. Okay, so what this is, this is a collection of IPython or Jupyter notebooks for like a one to, do one to two day course intended to teach you ops by. And it, can, it goes like the, what we're doing today, it's like the first thing is a notebook that introduces you to common file formats in Seismology and how to work with them in ops by. And that's just a short introduction to give you an overview of how all the different pieces kind of fit together. And the next ones are going to go into a bit more details. There's one notebook on dealing with absolute time objects. There's one for, and then there's one for all of the, wave, um, the data types. There's one for the waveform types, one for the station information, the event information. And after this, I'll teach you how to get data from data centers. 
And the remaining time, however much is left, was spent with exercises. So those are really, you will have to do almost everything yourself, but they're really intended to, for you to apply all the things you learned, you previously learned, and I'll walk around and help you. There's one small exercise where we do basically downloading and processing of some information, and then there's a more advanced one. I'm not sure if we'll get to that. And you see also for all notebooks you see here, if you click on it, it will open the actual notebook, and there's a second one with a solution to the exercise in the notebook. So you can easily do this at home and just see what happens. So we'll start with the introduction to file formats and read, write, and upspy. Okay, so you click on it. Once again, opens a separate tab with these with these notebooks. Okay, have you all seen these notebooks? You kind of know how to do it. Okay, good. I'm gonna toggle the toolbar and the header a bit more space. Is this big enough, or should I make it a bit a bit bigger? But I mean, you have the same on your screen, so can't read it, just read it on your screen. Okay. So, um, again, all these notebooks, they have some kind of setup functions. In all these notebooks, you will find one cell at the very top. Please just make sure to execute it. So it has like a number right here. That just sets up that the plots show up in the notebook, they don't pop up in a separate window, that they behave the same, Python 2 and 3, and that the plots look a bit nicer by default, okay? You don't have to worry too much, just make sure to always execute it. Even if you restart the notebook, execute that. Okay, I'm going to talk very quickly about uh, seed identifiers. So according to the seed standard, written by Tim Ahern in the back, which <laughs> um, is fairly well adopted. In seismology, it's quite pervasive to use the following nomenclature to identify seismic receivers. So you have the network code, which identifies the network and owner of the data, which I think is assigned by the FDSN and thus unique. Uh, the station code, which is one station within that particular operating network, which um, I think it was intended to be a unique code, but it tends in practice not to be unique. So you always need the network and the station code to uniquely identify a station. And then there's the location ID, which is a bit of a weird one. It identifies different data streams. I guess it's one of saying it's within one station. And it's usually used to logically separate multiple instruments at a single station. And the last one is the channel code, which is the actual recording instrument. So it usually has the band, like the three, there's a three character code. The first one is the band on the approximate sampling rate. The second one, the type of instrument, it's usually high gain or low gain sensor. And the last one is the orientation. Okay, and this is usually true across almost all waveform formats in seismology, which is quite nice. And this results in full IDs of the form network station, location, channel. An example here is an Italian station. And what also happens a lot, the location code is oftentimes empty. But that's also a valid location code. Doesn't mean it's missing, it's just empty. Okay, and as I said before, in seismology, we generally distinguish between th three types of data. That's also reflected in the FGSN web services. There's three, three services, one for each type of data. And that's also how we deal with it with an upspy. We have the waveform, the station, and the event data. And there are some data formats which have elements of two or more of all of these. Okay, so this doesn't directly map to the data types. Like with MiniSeed, it's only waveform data, but SUC, for example, contains some station as well as event information. Okay, so this notebook will shortly go over all three, how you deal with it in UpSpy, and the net next notebooks will go into more detail. So this so far is still very, fairly non-interactive. Please, anytime if something doesn't work, please try it on your own laptop. I go fairly slow. If you have some questions, raise your hand. It's really intended to, for you to understand what's going on. So this is again this cartoon. I showed in the talk with the stream and the trace. That's the hierarchy of all the stream and trace objects are built up. And in seismology, there are like a ton of different formats, but usually it's oftentimes MiniSeed or SAC. So MiniSeed is what you get from the data centers. SAC is what many people use to actually work with the data. And thus, they say here MiniSeed is what you get from the data centers, and that's probably pretty close to what was recorded at the instrument or what the digitizer. It can store integers as well as single and double, double precision floats. In practice, by data centers, it mostly tends to be integers, which are usually count from a digitizer. And the nice thing is that MiniSeed is very effective at data compression. So you usually get a factor of three to five when you get data from data centers, which is quite nice because it saves a lot of space. It can, as a format, in a certain sense, deal with gaps and overlaps. It does the same thing um, Upspy does. We'll just have separate, in a certain sense, records, and there's a gap or an overlap. It can contain multiple components per file, so it's possible to store three component data in one file. 
it's quite convenient. And, but it really only contains the necessary parameter of the time series. So there's no station information, no event information, almost nothing. That's really the raw format we have for, um, for the data sense and actually storing and archiving data. Okay, now let's get to the first piece of OpSpy code. So to use OpSpy, the very first thing you always do, you import it, which works the same with every Python package. You type import OpSpy, and this will load the OpSpy module into the current namespace. And then you can access functionality of opspy with a dot operator. So here is the opspy.read method. What is it actually big enough for you to see? No objection, so I guess it is. Okay. <laughs> you use the opspy.read method. That's just a function that will read whatever you pass it and create a stream, a stream object. Okay. So this function will read this file here in the data directory. It's called example.mseed and read it to the stream object. Then in Python, you can print stuff with a print function. And another thing that happens, as I told you before, stream, streams are collections of traces. So if you want to access the first trace in a stream, you have to use the pra angular brackets in zero and it gives you the first trace in the stream. And each trace, as you see up here, it has a stats dictionary. And what happens, there's some information like like um, start time, end time, well not every format has that, it needs that, but there's some um, format specific information. So Miniseed might have the record count or the data encoding or whatnot. And that's always stored in a format specific piece of our meta information. So for Miniseed, it will be in stats.mseed. This will give you the meta, um, the format specific information about any kind of file, file format. So if you execute that, you note it did automatically detect the file format. So now it did just read it. I print it, you see here, now it says there are six traces in the stream, okay? So this is a six, in this certain sense, it's a three component stream with a gap in the middle. This ends up being six traces. Okay, that's actually quite common in practice. And for each trace, it shows you the network, the station, location, and the channel. That's the start and the end time. So we define start time as the time of the first sample and end time as the time of the last sample. Okay, and then it has some more we have the sampling rate and the number of samples. And you can mix any kind of traces with a one-stream object. And this last line here, that's the result of stats.mseed. So you see here for Miniseed, it, it counts the number of records in the file, the data quality indicator, the actual record length. So that's actually the length of the first record. If it varies, it'll be the length of the first. The file just encoding a number of things. For SAC, for example, this would be like uh, the station location, event ID, and all these things. You have a question? So when you pull in these uh, screens, uh, do you sense when there's a time here? Yeah, we do. Um, what logic do you use? The same libmc does. I think it's half a sample period. Okay. So because mini seed is built up on records, like very two second pieces, so one after the other. So you have to detect if they're continuous or not. And ops by splits if the end time and the start, the end time of the previous record and the start time of the Next record, or like a plus one, differ by more than half a sample, then we'll make a gap in, in time series or an overlap. But yeah, that's probably the most common practice right now to do it like this. But we use libmc under the hood, so we do pretty much exactly like it does. Once you have this object here, this the, uh, um, the stream object, you can plot it. So you can execute this here, and it will show you a plot. And you notice here now it's only three. So the plotting method by default is smart enough to show the gaps and overlaps. Like that's only a five second gap here, whatever, you know, 13 second gap. So you, you don't see it in the whole day. Okay, well, like, how long is that? Three hours. You don't see a couple second gap on, on, on the time span, but you see the plotting method is smart enough to deal with that. If this overlap is colored red, and the plotting method, it has a couple of options to avoid that. But just a quick way, if you have some data, you want to visualize it, you type dot plot, and you have a plot of the data. So that's usually quite useful. Okay, and this here now is a quick interlude to teach you how to work with the stream and trace objects. We will see a lot more of this in one or two notebooks later. So one thing that does confuse people and it's especially bad in the notebook is that most operations work in place. So if you taper, trigger, or filter something, it modifies the actual stream object in place. That's a conscious choice you made. We didn't want to copy the stuff all the time. In the practice, that's how you process data sequentially, so you don't need the actual copy. 
if you need to work on a copy of the data, you should call the copy method. Okay? This returns a copy of that object. Now you have two and you can process them both in separate ways. That's quite confusing in the notebook because if you execute a notebook multiple times, like a, that's a cell, if you execute it multiple times and you filter it, you might filter it twice or three times. So just be a bit careful because that is confusing. And almost all the things we have, they work in place. Just, just really keep that in mind that you might, a lot of times it's just nice to make a copy and work with a copy so you can keep experimenting. Okay. Well, this will not create a copy. We just create a different name for the same thing in memory. So if you act one an actual copy, you have to do this. If you just do st2 equals st, then you modify st, then st2 will also be changed. It's like a pointer in C of it. So Python usually works by references. So this, yeah, if you just do this here, you don't create a copy. Just, just use the copy. Okay. Um, a very useful method, because I said we have four like streams or collection of traces, you might to work on, only want to work on a subset of these. There's a select method. And it just shows you, the comp you can say, okay, I want to, from this here, I want to select the vertical component. And it gives you back only these. This may be a good time to show you the documentation. So it's at uh, docs.opspy.org. 